I want to let you know you are our iHeartRadio. We we got picked up by iHeartRadio less than 24 hours ago. It's funny because this is our inaugural show and I'm excited about this because it's like when you first get on a show and things happen and it's live, it's live radio, what you get is a level of authenticity. You get to hear uh, you know, what's happening from the start and everything else. And I just want to welcome you. First off, uh, this is a very intimate conversation, and I want to set some ground rules as we have this intimate conversation. We're going to be letting Maya answer your questions. We're not going to, we're going to be fielding the questions. So if you're one of those mask or no mask, we aren't dealing with politics right now. We are dealing with something that's very serious. It's happening in the world that a lot of people don't even believe exists. And some people are still saying, even if it's a pandemic, okay, it's here. And one of them is COVID. And COVID is right where, where the country in the United States that has the most COVID patients. And we are speaking with someone who is the first New York case of COVID and also a survivor of COVID. And because of that, uh, first off, I just wanna say, how are you feeling right now? I'm doing well, thank you so much for having me. I hope you guys can hear me. I lost my voice two months post COVID after recovery. So I'm doing well. And thank you so much, Vicki, for having me. And of course, I miss all the fans and all the people out there communicating and lifting me up as I go, but I really miss contributing like I've always done before. So this yeah. is wonderful. Congratulations at iHeart. That is so fantastic. And all the viewers and the people today, I hope everyone is in great health and we'll get this show on the road. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, it's so interesting. I wanna let you know that pre-COVID, Maya McNulty was a thriving entrepreneur, two-time bestseller, uh, best-selling author. She had a podcast of her own. And I want to let her tell you what happened. I mean, thriving life. She still has a thriving life right now. I think you are singularly my most inspiring person. Like if I had to say person of the year right now, I would say you because you are displaying such incredible courage. And I have been following, I want to tell you, um, Maya and I have been friends. Uh, we met at a conference. Uh, we were in a mastermind group, uh, the two comma club. And we were also in the two comma club, um, kind of graduates, uh, group. And Maya is always there talking to everybody always, always, always. And I'd listen, I'd talk and we'd respond, et cetera. And then suddenly nothing. You heard nothing. And I kept asking, has anybody heard from Maya? Has anybody heard from Maya? Where's Maya? Has anybody heard from, I mean, nothing there one day gone the next. And finally, 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 uh, I heard through the grapevine that she was fighting for her life. And we started prayer circles and things that just to help her uh, because it was so sudden and it was shocking the shock that came through us. And um, one of the things that that really helped me believe in the courage of humanity is watching her recovery. And so I just want to tell you what, just share with us what happened. What was, what was your whole story? Well, thank you. And, you know, I never thought it would happen to me. I was really just going to the gym and just trying to get healthy because, you know, it was the top of the new year. It was in mm -hmm. March, early March. And we had just come back from Nashville for Funnel Hacking Live, where we mm -hmm. entrepreneurs learn new ways of marketing ourselves. And we share that knowledge and we collaborate. And I was really, you know, when you go to conventions, it's like the energizer bunny. You get plugged yeah. in and recharged. <laughs> and so I had all of this ambition. And 2020 was going to be the best year ever because I was going to implement everything that I've learned in Nashville just three weeks before I had fallen to COVID. And I was going to the gym. And I wasn't the first in New York, but I was the one of the very first severe cases 
with women, younger women in upstate New York. And <clears throat> while most were dying because they had the wrong information, they said that how it was elderly and it wouldn't affect the old, the younger people or children. Well, fast track today, we know that it yes. does. And in the concept of wearing masks, we were told misinformation about mask wearing. However, at the gym, I always wiped down the equipment before and after use. And I always bring my own towel and my own water bottle. Like I never drink from the fountain because I honestly think that's gross because everybody's sweating yeah. and leaning over the fountain. <laughs> so I never, never do that. But that particular day, the guy at the front desk at the gym, he's so adorable. And I mm. always make it a point to say hello. And so, you know, a little flirty, I said, I'm going to change it up today. And he says, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to work on my arms and I'm going to do the massage chair because I'm sitting at the computer. My neck is a little tight and stiff. And then I'm going to treat myself to the sauna. Well, mm -hmm. the sauna was where I walked into that airborne, literally a peach tree dish of COVID. And it hit me so hard. I just had to get out of there. I got in my car and I got home. My husband was mowing the lawn. I got out of the car and I said, honey, I don't feel well. And I don't know what it is because it's just a light, airy feeling. And wow. I had no symptoms. But that particular week also, I went to my doctors for my annual checkup. And I said to him that how... Um, do you think I have COVID because I started with this little cough now? And um, he mm. said, no, it's just probably just the flu season type of thing. So I said, okay. So I just went on my way. But he did give me an inhaler, Simbacort and Amoxicillin, just in case because it's flu season and just in case it's mm. Well, come that Wednesday, I started to die. Uh, come that Friday. Mm. I started to not feel well at all. And wow. I said, you know, it was Friday the 13th. And I said, I don't know what's happening to me. Mm. Sadly, I not take it anymore. My husband was working. So I drove myself to the emergency room. Mm. And he said, no, you don't have COVID. They tested me for pneumonia. And that was negative. And then I said, will you please, do you guys have the test? Will you please test me? And they said, well, we do have the test. And if you're insisting on it, we'll test you. It turns out I had COVID. And I knew I had something because when I walked into that peach tree dish, something hit me unusual. And I'm a pretty active, healthy, yes. no prior medical mm -hmm. conditions. I um, wow. get eight hours of sleep. I drink plenty of water and fluids. I'm mm -hmm. active. I have enthusiasm. I have a great outlook on life. That's true. I'm That's true. That's and true. I, I kind of started to miss all of that. Like, why do I feel like this? And I felt mm -hmm. like such crap. And like most people, we don't take ourselves to the emergency room unless we actually are dying. That's true. <laughs> so I decided I went. I told my husband and he says, why are you there? And I said, because I can't take it anymore. I don't know what's wrong. It's not right. And I was actually starting to die. But they just gave me IV, two bags of IV, some amoxicillin, uh, Zithromax, and sent me home. My husband went and picked up the medicine. And uh, I went to bed, and I literally didn't leave my room until he carried me down the steps because by Wednesday I was dying of respiratory failure. So the following Saturday, the 21st, my husband carried me down out of bed. I said, I'm not going. They already told me, my doctor said there's nothing wrong with me that I only have the flu. Those mm. they said that have tested positive for COVID that you just have to uh, rest for 14 days and it'll go away. Well, it didn't go away. And if my husband didn't save my life, I wouldn't be able to help others with science and education and recovery. And the families were also going through 
recovery, which I feel is a very missing component to this healing process. And I really didn't have the courage when I was in the hospital for 69 days. I was on a ventilator for six weeks. I was in wow. a coma for 30 days. They tried every drug on me, including uh, the hydrochloroquine, which they were saying was going to save your life. Well, it didn't work. But what did work was the remdesivir and the 10-day dosage of that. I was in a prone position most of my 35 days at Ellis Hospital in upstate New York, which is when you're laying on your stomach because my lungs kept collapsing. So I have keloid scars on my neck, I have keloid scars down here, some ventilator and trach, but first the ventilator was in my mouth. And then, you know, oftentimes people can't survive on ventilators. So, they say that 20%, 15 to 20% of people die within the very first couple days or even week. And I was on it for 30 days. And so what had happened was when the ventilator was on me, my, my lungs collapsed, but they kept putting it in my mouth and on my head, like here, and in a prone position. And that's how come this scar happened because of the pressure of it, the rubbing pressure. And it's gotten infected, and it's a battle scar, scar of honor, I guess. And I have to have injections, steroid injections, every four weeks in my neck, in that raw scar. So it's a new life now, but I'm here to tell it. And God survived, made me survive because of the prayer groups. And thank you so much for being a part of that and in that, because you were lifting me up when I, I was actually asking God, when I woke up out of that coma, I didn't know what happened to me. I thought I had a stroke because I was drooling. I had stroke-like symptoms and I was drooling in my left side, which I'm still not 100% um, on that yet. My left side, I'm still having trouble walking and holding things and I'm left-handed. So it's been mm. a little, but I go in little steps and I make a plan and I try to execute that plan every day. And if I don't get it all done, it's okay. I just save it for the next, but I get my therapies and my therapists have been my angels and my nurses. Yes, they are. Real shampoo and real dial soap when I was in the <laughs> hospital and helped me to shower. That was amazing of them. And I cried when I had my first shower. I had six showers in 69 days. Because wow. Of and I was in so much pain that I asked God to take my life because if I was going to be a vegetable for the rest of my life, I yeah. didn't want to live. And also, I was in so much pain, I would pray every night and cry every night and say, God, please, especially my daughter and husband, don't find this pain, anyone. Take it and sweep, break it into a million pieces and sweep it off off the earth that no one would find it because it was so painful. And now I have PTSD. Of course of you do. Of course you do. Sometimes people don't believe because they're not familiar with this new disease and new virus. And so I'm going to have to be the story and the voice. And honestly, I wasn't going to tell my story, but then the my friends in the prayer group all said, you have to, you have it. You're going to save lives yes. and you're going to tell people that there's hope and you can do it. And so I, I just mustered up the strength and the courage. And I often just look like I'm this strong healing person, but I'm scared inside because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if, all those big dreams I had prior to COVID will ever be the truth. So yes. I'm a little nervous. Yes. I, I want to stop you right there because you've said so many important things. Um, one of them is that uh, I want to go back to your hospitalization. Uh, 30 days in a coma. You don't know what's happened to you. You just know that you're alive. Uh, you get to the point where you are 
um, at home and your husband. Whew, I'm going to try. I didn't know what this was going to, you know, I knew it was going to be important, but this is so important. Your husband saves your life. The man lifts you up, carries you to the hospital. You stay there. You're there 69 days. Is that what I hear? 69 days in the hospital. And you now are dealing with something where your brilliant life, and I want to say this right now because you didn't think it was going to happen to you. It wasn't going to affect the young people. It wasn't going to affect the healthy people. Is They didn't know what they didn't know, and they still don't. COVID is still early, and people are like, well, the survival rate is still, it's not the survival rate that matters right now. It's surviving, and some people get well, and some people have symptoms that keep occurring and they're called long hauler symptoms. And you started experiencing that when you were in the hospital, what are some of the long hauler symptoms that you are dealing with right now or ha or dealt with? When I was in the hospital, I started to lose my hair. And prior to this, no one knew that my hair was long. I mean, you did. Because it's beautiful long. And if you go back in some of my videos, you'll see. But my hair all fell out, and you can see how thin it is. There's there's nothing to it anymore. It's starting. I'm on hair supplements and um, and uh, vitamins and special shampoos. Uh, I'm even taking prenatals now because I figured – they worked when I was pregnant to bring a life into this world. So yes. maybe it'll work to bring my Give life. Give you life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but they were telling me that how it was because of all the medicines I was on and also because of uh, the stress and trauma. But honestly, it was the third phase of ha hair loss, which is called telogen, which is the most severe part of hair loss. But again, this was untold found science. And mm -hmm. I participated in a study at Mayo Clinic in Mount Sinai on different long haulers and long hauler symptoms like voice loss, which occurred two months later. They said to me that my voice loss was not due to the ventilator because it was in there so long that perhaps uh what's doing ent which is a camera going up your nose down through your body here and coming out to check your larynx your vocal boxes and your cords and it turned out that my folds my bilateral folds went like this and sometimes when i cough they go like this so i can down my head and flip it and you can hear my voice normal Wow. Back up. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so that's. Some Do of the that stuff again. Do that again. That. That I'm going through. And so there is hope. I will get my voice back, but it might sound like this. Mart Simpson is what I've been. Uh, Mart Simpson's <laughs> been on air for a long time. So, yeah. hey. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so she's loved by many. So I said, okay, that's not a bad idea. But yeah. And. I get red hot toes, or they call them COVID toes. Yeah. Some people who have diabetes have black COVID toes, but mine are just red hot. And I have a powder, sort of like if you had like an itch, um, a vaginal itch, you could use the same powder on your toes. And so that's what I've been doing to subside the itch from there. Mm. Um, I've had problems with coughing and phlegm, voice, uh, headaches and dizziness and tremors. Last night was my mother's birthday and she came over. I saw that. Pizza, and I couldn't get off the kitchen table last night because my legs from sitting up started to trim and I, I wasn't able to hold myself up. So my husband got a hospital bed for me, and it's in our living room. <sighs> and if I, if I go up the steps too many times, I can't either get down or I can't get up again. So it's safer for me to be downstairs where I have like uh, emergency showers down the set shower bench. It's, it's kind of like handicap accessible, if you will, with the special 
toilet chair and bench and stuff. So I can do a lot of things on my own now. In the beginning, I had to have everybody do it for me. I had a nurse and the, an occupational therapist and a physical therapist who came every week. And now I'm just voice therapy and physical therapy. So every week, but uh, three days a week. So voice one and therapy twice, both for an hour. And so I'm not able to cook or lift things like I used to, but I can toast my own bagel and I <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And I can pour a bowl of have a bowl of cereal and pour my own milk. So these are my big wins. And I could do laundry and I never thought I'd be happy to do laundry because it helps yeah. with my motor skills with folding and my arm strength. So I would say that you know, the things that we hate and despise, you're going to learn to love them again. But I pray you don't have COVID. And there are different cases of it. And if I could share a little bit, this is COVID per se, and the ball, and this is the crown. And Corona means crown. And these are the proteins. And somehow the protein virus got left behind from surface and i walked into that heat because also that go away in the heat but there was no ventilation in a sauna and there was all heat so i knew when that fact was out i didn't watch tv very much when i was in the hospital because i didn't have strength in my hands to change the channel or even turn it on much less call for help on the call box, right? Wow. So they gave me a handicap one so I could hit it with my elbow and they could come if I needed nurse assistance by call bell. So, um, so yeah, there were just little modifications that we had to make when I was first in the hospital. But now I'm getting my voice back, and my husband says I'm demanding. So I must be <laughs> on recovery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is such an interesting thing. So you are on a crusade right now. I've watched you be on a crusade, uh, writing blog posts, and because you don't have a lot of voice, so you went to writing. I've been reading all your blog posts and can you tell everybody about your crusade, what you're trying to do, what, why are you trying to educate people right now? What's your purpose and mission uh, right now that you've been working on? Uh, that's a great question. And thank you for asking Vicki. So I really don't know what my purpose is. I'm trying to figure it out, but my survival is my certificate. That's right. That's what I've come to conclusion. And if I could help organizations such as hospitals or post-COVID recovery clinics, wellness clinics, education, help someone else to ease the pain of watching a loved one suffer. When I was in the hospital, I couldn't have visitors. I did lose hope. It was dark. I couldn't hold the iPad up to have a Zoom call with my husband or my daughter. Mm -hmm. The last I knew my daughter was in college and it was exam time and she was told to come home to say goodbye to her mother. <sighs> that was the last I knew because my husband had to tell her that. That was hard. So if I could give support to someone who's in the hospital and then their parents are elderly, the nursing homes, and they don't know what they're going through. But I was sort of dying of heartache and heartbreak. But it was the staff and the therapy and the nurses that lifted me up and they became my hospital family. And know that your moms and dads and whoever's in the hospital, these nurses and doctors, they love you. Yeah. They love their job they care and if there's a way you can get them more supplies like shampoos and conditioners and dial soap because it has bacteria in it that will take the bacteria away from your bodies from being laying in a bed wow. if you want to make a difference 
Find a local hospital that you could donate something to to enrich their lives. You can do that. You can make cards and send it to them. You don't have, you can make it with paper, make it a project at home since there's so many mm -hmm. kids remote learning. They can use that. Drop groceries off to a family. Send, send food because there's, you know, DoorDash and Uber Eats and things like that. That would really help someone. But you don't have to be this person that feels hopeless because you can give hope just by a phone call or a smile. Um, mm -hmm. I know when I was in the hospital, it was Mother's Day. And my daughter sent me flowers and she said, Mom, you're a badass. And I was like, okay, I have that. She's okay. She's ready to roll. And I was like, you're right. I am a badass. And I want to tell my story because it's going to save lives and it's going to give people hope. And I've already helped with education from Indiana University School of Medicine with Dr. Lambert. I've helped with intake forms with hospitals to change the trajectory of inpatient post-COVID and pre-COVID symptoms and the severity scale of that. So when you go to your hospitals and you fill out a form and the great pain scale has changed, I had a hand in that. So mm. that they can better assess you because when I was there, they didn't know how to assess me. And so mm. besides, you, know, you don't have that. But now there's a pain scale rate to say this is your pre-COVID level of severity. And now there's <sighs> a post-COVID scale rate that will say these are your pain scale rates so that your long haulers, your mental and physical, emotional health will be taken seriously. Well, I, I, I've been doing. And I want to ask to be able to lift someone else up because there were prayer groups that I didn't even know about. We have people in law enforcement that are our family members, and they have seen the darkest of dark, not just through COVID, but it's important to know that you support them. We have family members that are nurses and doctors. My daughter studying neuroscience. She's going into the medical field to lift people up, and she's even more inspired now because she's yes, saved her mom, yes. And she's also going to be working with the doctor that saved my life. Wow, he's going to help her because right now there's not too many opportunities for internships because of this scared yes. life that we're living in. Yes. We shouldn't let our guards down. We should practice the basic simplicities of washing our hands, covering our mouths with masks. We should use hand sanitizers. We should stay home. We should limit our interactions in large crowds. Those yes. are common sense things. But you have the power to take care of you because it is your body. You are in charge of you. Just as if you wanted to lose 10 pounds, you have to monitor what you're eating and when and how often you are digesting those calories. It is up to you. And it's not anybody else's fault. It's not a black or white or red or blue. It is a thing that you are responsible for yourself because you are smart enough to know better. May I ask you, sure. for all the long haulers that are watching you right now, for people that have long haulers, what would you like to say to them if they're when they're starting the process and say to their families when we're starting this process? May I share five things that I would like to share with them? Absolutely. Because I'd love to hear them. <laughs> these things helped me. And Long Haulers was first discovered by this girl. Her last name is Watson. And she had COVID, but not as severe as I did. And Long Haulers can affect anyone at any level of severity. So that is one point you need to make clear. But... If you have COVID on any level, you will experience fatigue. You will experience things that you haven't 
experienced before. The CDC says there are eight to nine or 10 things we've documented in our research with Survivors Corp, a hundred different long haulers. And so these are gonna start to become very prevalent, very aware so that you do not feel alone and that you're crazy because most people think that you're crazy that you're experiencing these things and they also come to the conclusion that well what if it was this before this well for me a little cough always triggers me to think oh my god am i getting another onset of covid yes or is it coming back because we're scared and we're nervous but one number one thing i would say is get plenty of rest if you're a long hauler because the fatigue will fr will start to creep in and you'll think it's other things. So get plenty of rest. The second thing I would tell you to do is join a Facebook group, either Body Politics on Slack or Survivors Corp or some of them, but there's many. And Survivors Corp is one that I'm active in in Body Corp, Body Politic. Those two have the best science uh, doctors involved and I feel that I get heard and I'm also able to contribute and be compassionate and have empathy. So get involved in a Facebook group that you feel that you don't have to do all of them, but one that you want to be heard so that you don't feel alone because your symptoms might start to drag you down and cause that emotional stress that you don't need because it will start to be as brain fog and also you'll start feeling like you're alone and I don't want you to feel alone. The third thing I tell you to do is document it. Document your journey, write it on a calendar and you don't have to be a 20 time best-selling author or two time or even a one time. Bullet it, say today I had tremors, I had shakiness, I had a headache. Document on the calendar and then you'll go back because it'll trigger saying how you felt because you won't forget how you felt. Yeah. And make sure you drink a lot of water to help get that H2O flowing in your blood and that you don't get that brain fog and tightness up in your neck and in your voice box and stuff. So I drink about three of these a day. It's a lot, but I know that it's going to help me and help my throat. So do that. Mark your calendar and bullet point it so you can go back and do it. The fourth thing I tell you to do is don't overdo it. Don't overdo thinking you got to do what the way you used to do it because you're not the way you used to be. It took me a while to understand that. It took me a while to understand why my heart rate elevates with just sitting or eating dinner or taking a shower mm. or just simply talking or sitting quietly. It's all very uncommon, but now it's being very familiar because I've documented it and I know what to expect. And again, my survival is my certificate. I know what's happening to me better than anyone else will. So yes. document the journey, don't overdo it know when you're in control and eventually you'll be able to walk that mile or take that hike again but it's okay because mm. no one else can walk that mile in your shoes so be consistent be persistent and don't overdo it and the last thing i will tell you to do number five is to communicate to communicate to yeah. your friends to your family members to your doctors to your social media group of paid people because you don't know who you're who's listening and who you're inspiring along the way and you never know whose life you're going to save and yes. so communicate what you're feeling and you'll avoid depression you'll avoid mental anguish you'll avoid financial ruin because you'll see that everyone else is struggling too and maybe you have to pivot during these times because everyone knows everyone is pivoting at this time they're going online they're shopping few few for days instead of running to the market to pick up fresh meat they're picking it all up on one day they're changing the way they do things in schools teachers had to learn a new way to teach 
Doctors have to learn a new way to take on their patients, whether it be telemedicine or coming in the back entrance because you've got COVID and you don't want to get that peach tree dish out to everyone else. But communicate what you're feeling and what you're going through so that you can lift yourself up and lift others up while you're doing it because you are not not alone no matter what you think or believe because you have the power to communicate use your voice even when i lost my voice i could type i could write and i yes could much because i'm left-handed and yes. i had to peck like a chicken with my right <laughs> hand and it took me a long time but i did <clears throat> so you can do it too and my vision for you is I can see you as a survivor telling your story too. So communicate. Those are the five things, Vicki, that I'd like to share on that. Thank you. I, that was so beautifully said and so beautifully done. We have people talking a mile a minute over here. Donnie says, Maya McNulty, just being who you are and sharing who you are brings your voice of truth and reality to this virus. Most importantly, the bigness of your heart, greater than three, so much love and support being sent your way. You have made a difference and are making a difference. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who this is. Maya McNulty is an amazing spokesperson for COVID. Listen to her advice for those who have COVID on every level. My heart has been truly touched by today. Thank you. Uh, Maya McNulty, you are incredible. Love you, sister. Thank you. And this is um, right here. Maya McNulty is a hero a COVID warrior. Now here, I want to go a little bit deeper. I, I see you guys talking and you can ask the questions or make your statements. We'll certainly share them with Maya and continue this conversation. This is an opportunity, an opportunity to have an open conversation. We've had an intimate conversation, somebody who's been very vulnerable at sharing what she has been through, how it made her feel, um, uh, I love, I love this rare is the voice of the COVID survivor heard. Yes. And this is the point the COVID survivors heard. We hear all the political and Dr. Fauci and blah, blah, blah. Why don't we just talk to the people who've been through it or going through it? What I think is so courageous, Maya, and the reason I wanted you on my show so badly, um, is because I knew of your courage. I knew who you were before. I know that you are still that afterwards. I know that right now your heart is bruised. I know that you have a bit of PTSD and I know what that's like. I'm an ex-cop. But I also know that the courage you have is the gift you bring, just your presence. And for whatever happened, you are still the most beautiful, dynamic, wonderful person to have on this show talking about such a hard topic with a beautiful smile on your face, with the awareness that we're going to have one conversation at a time. Here's where I want to go. I want to talk about though to those people who do not believe COVID is real. They believe that it's fake. And we're talking with people there because I just want you to hear this. It's not about getting COVID. It's about what's going to happen to your life after you have COVID, after the aftermath of that. And it could be mild or it could be big. We don't know. And the recovery from that is going to be long-term, whether it's mild, even Melania is backed out of the uh, talking around the world and going to rallies because she is still got it. She's still tired. And you said a couple of things about rest. What happens? What would you say to families right now who are wanting to get together for holidays? And uh, we have a tend tendency to think, well, our family member isn't going to be sick. It's not there. It's okay to have these people over. This year is different. We're heading into numbers of COVID that we've not seen before. We're setting, you know, big records. Some states are 50% up, some more than that. What would you say to people with their loved ones? How would you handle the holiday conversation? And I'm putting her on the spots. She has no idea I'm asking these questions. We have no 
pre-thought questions. We had no uh, way of, we just are talking right now and asking these questions. My thoughts on the holidays? Well, we kind of were already doing online shopping for most of our holidays. So most people will probably continue to do that. As for getting together with families, I love my family too. I want to hug and kiss them. But if I'm going to infect them, that doesn't serve me or them in the long run. Yes. And for me, my story is very real for my family and for people that have witnessed. Like I said, there was many prayer groups. I had the police department and even the jail, every church in my community, ones I don't even know and ones that I do. I had prayer groups online and chain prayers. There were so many people praying for me that I somehow probably impacted them in a way where they would think about it before mm -hmm. they said, we're going to have 10 people over for Thanksgiving. It's a lovely thought and a lovely gesture. And there's people that don't want to be alone on Thanksgiving because that is one of the things that people struggle with, being lonely on Thanksgiving and during the holidays. And people that are in the nursing home, again, mm -hmm. It's been seven, eight months that so you haven't been able to see your loved ones. And in New York, um, you're in Colorado. Um, I know people are listening from New Zealand and in Australia. Yeah. But it doesn't matter where you live. COVID is real. Look at the death toll. Over yeah. 20 million. You know, here in the United States, we're past the 8 million mark. We're... 200 and like 21,000, 222,000. If that's not waking you up, but again, you have the power to social distance. You have the power to wear a mask. You have the power to wash your hands. You have the power to not be in large groups. It's just basically up to you. Now, when people or family wants to come and see me, I actually have a questionnaire that I actually ask mm -hmm. them before they can come and be with me. And this is whether I do a TV interview, most of it is done online or uh, just two channels have done an in-person, but I do most of it online. There's so much wonderful technology. Yes. So, I mean, you could have your pasta party on Zoom now, you know, yeah. the turkey's <laughs> giving turkey cutting, carving, you know, have yeah. it on Zoom, so you're really su supporting each other. But be diligent. And I don't want to tell people what to do, but my, um, my list is, have you been around? How many people have you been around? Have you gotten tested for COVID? How much um, interactions like with dining out have you had? Because you could just have been with your family. Um, two of you is out to eat, but I caught it from a surface. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know. You're not going to shower before you come and see me because you just went out for lunch. So, <laughs> I, I have questions. So, if they answered no or yes to one of these questions, yes, I had a COVID test, but no, I don't know how many people I've been around. Then I'm like, okay, can we do a Zoom call or can we do a Facebook something, you know, Messenger or IMB or something? I just change and pivot because mm -hmm. I don't want to infect them and they don't want to infect me. Yes. And I don't want to be responsible for someone else when I'm barely trying to be responsible for yes. myself. Yes. Yes. You so know, it's interesting. I, I use a checklist to say uh, a questionnaire. You know, how many people have you been around? Have you been in yes. homes? Do, do you have a cough? Do you have a temperature? No, temperature, just so you know, too. We've been doing studies, and temperature checks are not a surefire way to say that you have COVID or you don't have COVID, one of the symptoms. But coughing is, and stomach GI issues are, uh, like diarrhea or cramping, any type of that. Um, 
brain fog, um, if you're starting to have thrush, or if you have swollen uh, glands down here, those are some signs and symptoms. If you have lost of taste, lost of smell, lost of appetite, those are more symptoms that you would have positive for COVID. So I ask those questions when people want to come see me and they're very respectful of it. Mm -hmm. Most people are. My husband and my, my, my husband and my daughter, because this is their home too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because it's one of the things is um, I'm very much aware of this COVID thing. I have a mother who's 82, going to be 83 this year. And one of the things that I am doing is protecting my family. My um, list of people I see, one of my best friends in the whole world, he had to go to a courthouse recently. And the next day, the courthouse had found five cases. And he right away put himself in quarantine and I miss him. I miss him. Even though I text him and, you know, he's part of my inner circle that has made a promise that we will not go anywhere, that we will not do these things. I've gotten, you know, families together. I'm very aware that this is going to be here. It's not a short game. It's a long game. They have to find vaccines and get things out and get this off there. And we are empowered to do the things we can do to protect ourselves from COVID. I just want to pop over here because these beautiful, beautiful uh, people are so touched today. Maya, there are no words to express the power of your information. Today was a gift. God bless you, your family, your recovery, your mission. Uh, Maya, I did not know you before today. I, I have nothing to compare you pre-COVID versus po co post-COVID, but uh, 2.0 is beyond extraordinary. And Karen, that is an underestimation. 2.0 is something. So I want to tell you a secret that I haven't told anyone. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get through this fast because um, it's take touching a for me. Take a deep me. breath. Whew, thank you. When you caught COVID... When they told me you were fighting for your life and they didn't know what was wrong with you and you were, you know, we had just, we had just been at this event. You don't think anything's going to happen to your friends. It's all going to be success and dreams happening, unfurling. And the day that you got knocked over and you were on a ventilator fighting for your life was the day I learned something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. And I wrote it to you. I say it most every day. There by the grace of God go I. You said the first thing in the beginning of this was that you didn't think you were going to get it. And I'm treating myself like I'm not going to get it. I'm, I'm being very preventative, very proactively preventative. I'm not going to get it. But I also realized that things can change on a dime just on a dime and that you may not have the opportunities later that you have right now to make a difference in the world. And that thing that you've been holding in your soul, that book that you've been wanting to write, that business you've wanted to open, that vacation you've wanted to take, that, that thing, that argument you want to clear up with your family member because you're tired of being estranged, that conversation where you are unwilling to forgive, you want to have that now. You want to have that now because you don't know why and you don't know when. And having somebody to uh, have those things, that one incident changed me forever, forever. And I've been watching your journey from there because honestly, I wanted to see what you were going to do because you're so vibrant already. You're still vibrant. You you exude vibrance right now into the world. I wanted to see what you were going to do. You guys, I'm going to pop over here and I'm just going to move this back. I see you. I'll let you talk to her. Okay, here we go. Maya McNulty, you are no longer a survivor of COVID, but instead you have chosen to be a thriver, a voice of truth, compassion, and understanding with a great power of love flowing through your heart. Yes, it's palpable. You can see that, Maya. You really can. They do so many, they do so many are chosen, but you have chosen to step forward to lead others with your great light, sending so much love and thoughts of prayers to you 
from Donnie. Thank you, Donnie. This is so good. Um, Karen says, if you aren't willing to protect yourself from COVID, then at least take action to protect others from you because you don't think you're going to get it or that you already have it. And it affects everyone. Um, Maya, it has been an honor to be your friend. Um, it's weird because this COVID has made our friendship grow a little bit deeper. It's made me realize that there is no time like the present to say, I love you to my family, to love those and do things and volunteer and do more uh, because you don't know when your time is up. It has made me realize that being strong doesn't necessarily mean I always have big muscles. It means I have big heart and big determination and big willingness. And your message to the world about this doesn't just come through your words. It comes through the attitude you have so much. It's like I get knocked down, but I get up again. And maybe I don't get up the same way, but I get up again. And I take my new message and I take my new uh, vision and I take my willingness to surrender to whatever God has given me and go out into the world and still continue to spread the message of, yes, you can. There is hope. Protect yourself. Get back up. It's an honor to have you on the show today. Um, I just can't even tell you how tender my heart is. Um, and I am going to be following you. But my last thing is, what if people want to follow your journey? If they want to help you out, if they want a connection with you, how can they be in contact with you virtually so that there's distance? Thank you so much for that heartfelt comment. And I'm so happy. And thank you for your prayer group. And thanks for having me today. And thank you to all the viewers and listeners. It's really an important topic. And I'm not the only survivor, but I am choosing to step forward and changing my story, change mm -hmm. the ending of the book, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. And my advice to people would be, attitude is everything have a positive attitude and the other thing is give yourself grace you have to be graceful in giving and receiving because mm -hmm. we're not perfect and we have to understand that during these times and i don't want to use the word unprecedented because it's been overused in 2020 but give yourself space time gratitude know that you're worth it know that there are people out there that want to listen to you even if your voice sounds like <laughs> yeah. but you could give people that hope and pass that yeah. torch of light or be that beacon of light to somebody i don't know what my story will be or where it will end but it certainly wasn't in that icu room on a ventilator <laughs> And now I know that I know that I have to do something that is more poignant and more important for the people who aren't listening, for the doctors because they need better research, and they also need somebody to communicate with so that they don't feel it's just science and it's just medicine because I'm a group of patient-led researchers and who best to learn it from than a survivor? And I yes, I communicate with my doctor and I had to tell him when I had brain fog or hair loss or memory loss, or I have tremors now on both my feet and burning toes and my hands just trim when I have 10 minutes of activity at physical therapist, physical therapy. I had to tell them about voice loss because they thought it was just a common thing for like laryngitis mm -hmm. and it's not laryngitis, it's a bilateral fold paresis, which could be along the lines of paralyzation, but mm. it's not paralyzation, but paresis is the root word of paralyzed. So yeah. that's not my story. I'm going to change the ending and I'm going to help. That's right. So if you are a survivor, if you know a survivor, be supportive in their journey and 
don't think they have the answers or all the answers and don't think you have all the answers. My husband has given me so much grace. I will say to him, honey, I walked the steps today. I climbed up all 15. And he'll say, did you do it alone? And he's like, and he doesn't want me to do it alone because my heart rate elevates and I can have a heart attack. So I'll say, yes, I did. Aren't you proud of me? But I have to remember to give myself grace in that time. So slow and steady, everybody. Slow and steady. You'll get back there, but give yourself grace. Have a positive attitude and things will fall into place. It's only a matter of time. Pandemics last about two years. I didn't even know what a pandemic was. I had to Google it. I know what an epidemic was, but I didn't know what a pandemic is. Because none of us are 100 years old. 1918 was the first pandemic, the Spanish flu. That's, that's right. That's right. A lot of the things the government is doing now, they did then. And a lot of the protesting was wear a mask or go to jail. Can you imagine wearing a mask or go to jail being the system that we have today? So I'm doing research and teaching people as I move along. But history repeats itself. But you don't have to fall into that. You can change the ending of the story. Just follow protocol. They're pretty simple. They're basic. And anybody can do it. You don't have to have a lot of money to wash your hands. You yeah. don't have a lot of money to stay in crowds. You know, mm -hmm. So that economically, you could roll that one out the window. But you are in control of wearing a mask and washing your hands and social distancing. Those are simple protocols. And the sooner you start following those protocols, the quicker this virus will subside. Even though there's another strand coming, you can whip it in the butt because you're smart and you know yes. how to control it. And yes. How to have it go away because we have technology now. We have better technology than we had in 1918. 2020, yes. we have better technology. Yes, yes. we have some people but we have better scientists and better technology yes. and more information readily available to help you get further ahead. Thank we you. Have a larger population and herd immunity is nearly impossible unless a lot of people die. Agreed, agreed. And right now, 11 people are dying. I'm sorry, one person is dying every 11 minutes. One person is dying of coronavirus every 11 minutes. That is going to be higher if you are trying to have herd immunity, which is impossible with this level of people that we have, so that over 7 billion. So we, it's impossible. Um, it'll be around for a longer time. So if you wanna nip it in the butt and see your grandkids on holidays and see your family members on birthdays and see them on Easter or New Year's, get back to the life as we know it for normalcy, pay attention. The curve can be flattened only if you are a part of a player in the game. And that's yeah. what we gotta think it as. It's a game and we gotta play it. We have to be smart and outsmart it. So, I'll take care of yourselves. Thank you, Maya, uh, for being a voice today for your journey with COVID. I don't think I've ever been as deeply touched as I have today because I heard your story. May God bless you and keep you and your family safe. You guys, um, this has been the Coffee Break Show. And today we are graced. And I just want to say this to you before we end the show. Maya, thank you. And there by the grace go I. See you guys tomorrow. That's a coffee break show for today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Maya.